Hello, I'm Eric Meyer. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I am Brian Cardell. I'm also a developer advocate at Egalia. And this week we're talking about polyfills. So, poly, I'm just going to do a very brief historical note. Uh, polyfill, for those who aren't aware, is, uh, I guess, a UK term for sort of like spackle or something that you use to fill in cracks or gaps and then it hardens. Uh, and so that's why that term ended up being used to refer to like little bits of JavaScript that we write to make up for the fact that one of the browsers we have to support doesn't uh, yet support a CSS thing or a JavaScript thing or even an HTML thing. Yeah, so there's like, um, I think this is an interesting thing that happens a lot of times in like um, not, not necessarily in, in standards, but in, you know, like, libraries and the you know language basically around computers is that like a thing is developing an idea is developing there's some like commonality developing to it but that doesn't have a name or it goes by a whole bunch of names and mm -hmm. then we give it a name and we rally around that name and then like the fact that we're all talking about the same thing also then like helps us move forward in other ways because we can like understand what we're talking about and think about it more concretely you know so um right. you know like remy sharp in, introduced that word but didn't uh invent polyfills right like um, right he he just gave them a really good name and an analogy that makes a lot of sense in the uk and not much in any other place <laughs> <laughs> but but it's okay because the word kind of works in my opinion um i guess people people have different agree different sense of whether that's okay or not um whether it right. needs the metaphor but um yeah i, I like it um I, I think this also has happened with like for example um i don't know if you know the sort of famous gang of four design patterns book I, but yeah. like, most of the patterns in there like it's not like those people invented those patterns necessarily it's like that they identified and named them and they you said like yeah this is a singleton and we've been doing singletons already at that point for you know a couple of decades maybe <laughs> but we didn't have a name for it and we didn't mm -hmm. have a, a common this is the pattern so yeah or the invention of uh the term ajax to yeah exactly um, yeah you know http request stuff um or for that matter responsive web design um, exactly. Yeah. The concept that was emerging, I, I would argue that Ethan did a little more work to sort of tie the pieces together, but it's not that uh, he necessarily invented out of thin air the whole concept of responsive web design, but he did give it a very handy name and show yeah. very in a very compelling way how this should work. So, Amazing demo that like yeah. really sold you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, right. So that's how we get the name polyfill. So if you didn't know that, great. Uh, now you do. Like very quickly, we got to like ideas like modernizer and, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically developers made it possible to move forward because the IE was stuck, right? And they mm -hmm. had most of the market share. So there was this like real tension between like, hey, there's this potentially really interesting, cool stuff. But practically speaking, we can't like there's no real excuse for you to actually use it, you know, so it's a very <laughs> chicken and egg problem. And polyfills like made yeah. it feasible for you to consider exploring some of that stuff. Yeah. Dean Edwards, IE7 um, mm -hmm. was a, in many ways groundbreaking in this area where he just he wrote a bunch of effectively CSS support for IE6 at a time when there was never going to be another Internet Explorer. Like you said, IE, Internet Explorer was just stuck. It wasn't moving. And IE6 was supposedly the last ever version of Internet Explorer. And people wanted to, you know, use stuff that IE6 didn't support. So Dean called it IE7 sort of as a, as a, uh, I don't know, a little bit of an elbow. Hmm. And then a few years later, Microsoft said, oh, yeah, just kidding. We're going to do more Internet Explorers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, I, I'm trying to, I can't remember. It's been too long now. I can't remember what IE7 added support for. 
Oh, it was almost nothing. Yeah, it was very, very small that... additions. It was just barely moving us forward. They were important mainly in that they restarted things. I mean, it. Yeah, it was not a. Wasn't a significant catch up. I can't remember what the specific ads were either, but they were really small. I mean, some of them, but it was, in a lot of ways, it 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 helped people move forward with CSS. I mean, it was really what it was mostly focused on. But yeah. anyway, yeah. So the, I mean, there's this long history of hacking our way around problems, right? Which is, you know, that's computer engineering since the dawn of time, pretty much. Um, but yeah, we, we have, uh, well, there was a lot of things happening at that same time, which is interesting. Uh, like another thing that seems to happen in history is like a lot of like early ideas and things are like crashing together and, mm. you know, um, so there were a bunch of people who started building a lot of polyfills, um, for the early stuff. Cause there was a lot to catch up on. I think I wrote a piece one time where, uh, I just literally went through and iterated all of the APIs mm -hmm. and put them into a giant, like green and red table, you know? And, okay, yeah. um, <laughs> and the trouble is that like the gaps then because it stayed stagnant, like the gap, the gaps kept growing and growing and growing. And I, I wrote this piece one time that showed that there were like 1500 in maybe 2012 or 2013, something like that. It's like 1500 APIs that were little squares that were red now in Microsoft land. And it just kept growing and growing and growing, you know? So, mm. um, so there were people like actively patching those because you don't need in practice all 1500 of those, right? Like if you don't use those 1500, who cares? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so practically speaking, you could find which of those you needed and find the polyfills as long as they existed. And and so there are a few people who wrote like just gobs and gobs of polyfills. Uh, John Neal was one of those people. Do you know John? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Matthias Bynes. Uh, yeah, a lot of those got used in, you know, got you could use those with like modernizer and a bunch of them were even put into embedded into the MDN documentation. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but that used to be a thing where like with array methods, for example. Okay. Yeah. Um, there were implementations of the array methods in the MDN where, you know, it was like, here's how you check for support and here's how you still enable support if it's not available, because that was mm. like such a common, like I said, it was like 90 some percent of your users were, didn't have support for it. Right. So yeah, there's a lot of thinking going on around polyfills and also around like models. Cause like, don't forget, this is like, um, you know, this is before ES 2015. Yeah. So they're, they're I mean, so polyfills are super, super useful. Right? Yeah. They're <laughs> super useful. Really useful. And, uh, sometimes that leads us down paths that in retrospect, maybe weren't the best. Like we've had a uh, situation recently where polyfill.io, which is a centralized library service, uh, there, there's been trouble, right? Uh, basically from what I understand, the uh, maintainer sold it and now whoever they sold it to was started serving weirdness um, in the... Uh, uh, up to people who were linking to that. It's sort of like if uh, Google fonts, right? That everybody, most everybody just links straight to the Google fonts servers and loads the fonts from there. If they started serving, uh, you know, corrupted fonts or something like that, um, yeah. or, or fonts that had executable code embedded in them, which I recently saw is actually a thing you can do. Um, so that, has happened and there like there are now articles from cloudflare about how to automatically replace links to polyfill.io with you know something less uh troublesome um and and just a whole lot of people saying wow you know the 
everything gets ruined, but you know, there's a part of me that that's like, why did, why did you link to a service in the first place? Why did you not have a local copy? Yeah. But this happens all the time, right? Sure. So like, um, so like, uh, this originates in all the way back in 2014, uh, in 2014, there was an article on, uh, hacks.mozilla.org. Um, Mm -hmm. and it was, uh, co-authored by, uh, Robert Nyman, uh, who we've done a lot of work with and Andrew Betts. Um, I don't know if you know, Andrew, do you know him? I do not think I do. Um, so Andrew, uh, was very involved in the community. Um, he also was an event organizer. He organized like, uh, all the like, um, edge, like edge comp and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, that's Mm -hmm. not about the edge browser not about the browser right yeah um and yeah i think maybe also uh had a a uk meetup but a uk web standards meetup but then also he uh served on the w3c technical architecture group um and yeah maybe maybe i do slightly recognize him i don't think we've ever met though so yeah um yeah i mean he's a very smart guy but anyway um the uh the article uh introduced this idea of a service and what the service would do is um look at the browser you know um right. it, it actually it had a few ways that it could work so i don't want to be unfair to it but uh it had a few ways mm. that it could work but the the easiest way um the one that kind of won the day was that it would look at your browser and try to identify your browser and then it would say well i know what things are missing right right and it would provide the polyfills for those you know mm-hmm. and i don't know this was great and terrible at the same time like in my opinion um i i think i was always honest about like i'm not sure that really relying on that is good in the long run. Um, mm-hmm. But that, that wasn't in, that wasn't a, a thought on anybody's mind in 2014, really, <laughs> you know, I mean, it just got popular and, and people used it and it was uh, then he also was the founder of FT labs, the financial times yep. like arm of the uh, technical arm. And, um, and so like, it was very scalable. It, like, it didn't involve a very, a lot of setup. You didn't have to deal with maintenance if there were issues. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's complicated. Like one of the comments that I made early on was like, well, you're using user agent sniffing. Is that really, that doesn't seem like the best thing. And they addressed that in the, in the article, why they chose it. Um, cause like maybe this particular version of IE has a broken implementation. <laughs> of that so you can't just feature detect it you know so i don't know it was very very interesting um it featured almost all of the uh polyfills by the two gentlemen that we that i mentioned earlier Mm -hmm. um and uh, there's again a lot of other things going on at at the same time about the same time we were also had established this extensible web community group and been uh, talking about this idea that I was out evangelizing that like, Hey, here's an interesting idea. If you can polyfill two browsers of three or four, why can't you polyfill four browsers of four? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why can't we experiment like that? And like, why is it that, um, and I I actually was representing at about this point, um, jQuery in the CSS working group. Like, why is it that everybody is like, jQuery has won, why don't we just standardize jQuery? Why is it that we can't do that? And it's like, well, because we didn't plan to do that. So now we can't do it, right? Mm. (laughs) Um, Because which version of jQuery are you gonna standardize? And if you choose the wrong one, then, well, there is no right one because you will break some websites no matter which one you standardize, you know? Mm. And there are ideas in jQuery that fit jQuery fine, but actually didn't match 
the CSS philosophy of things. So like jQuery, if you said like selector for an ID selector, it would always give you the first one. It would just map that to get element by ID. But, you know, in there's nothing special about an ID in CSS. It, you know, in terms of like, it doesn't actually limit them. So if you have right. 10 things with that ID and you say this should all be blue, they'll all be blue. Yeah. And then it takes really long because we can't agree. We can't, we can't like have ideas that actually compete somehow. Uh, if you do it in the standard mm. and, um, and we can't be wrong. Like we, like, you know, there's so much fear that we just can't be wrong. And so it was like, what if the web was like extensible so that you could, you could evolve the web, you know, you could find out what worked and what didn't work. We could run sort of multiple experiments and quickly because you don't need to write C and stuff, you know, like, yeah. Um, so we, we also registered this, this website called prolyfill.io, which was a play on words, you know, term that we coined that was like, what, what if we can't call it a polyfill because polyfill is the, in the metaphor, it's like filling these small holes. Right. But this is like standing up new walls, you know? So we did like, this isn't a polyfill. We don't want people to get confused. This isn't definitely a standard. This is like a proposal for a standard, you know? And along the way, we also helped set up uh, Robin Bergeon, who we had on recently was at W3C at the time. And he and I set up uh, a discord instance that we called specification. Yeah. And, um, you know, we basically, this became the, uh, the incubator community group, you know, uh, the idea that you would want to like incubate ideas and say like, these ones are not, they're not on a standards track yet, but like, we would like to figure them out among a group of people that is really serious about it that, and maybe make some polyfills and run some tests. And then along the way, in addition to polyfills, we got, um, origin trials, which is an interesting thing we could talk about maybe, but mm. yeah, I mean, in this, in this vision to me, polyfills do for the sort of the web in general, <laughs> what preprocessors have done in CSS land, which is there's a lot of in, in the preprocessors, you can do things like, you know, variables and mix-ins and uh, come up with functions that do color shifting or whatever. And then the ones that become popular because they're useful eventually make their way into CSS. Like we have variables, they're not called that, but we kind of have variables and we have uh, mixins are, are coming very uh, pretty soon. That's being worked on now. So, uh, the color shifting stuff is is there uh, and supported in, in at least some browsers. I think maybe all of the engines now, I'd have to check on that, but right, like that's sort of what preprocessors preprocessors have done in the CSS space is allow the community, like the wider community to experiment with ideas and for someone to come up with an idea and say, Hey, here's this thing. If anyone would like to use it, here's how you use it. And then if a bunch of people use it, then eventually the relevant working group in this case, the CSS working group says, yeah, that should be a thing that we actually have natively. And so these polyfills or prolyfills, <laughs> Uh, in, in either case, can be that way for CSS, but also for JavaScript, for HTML, right? Where you can write um, um, a polyfill that, uh, I don't know, adds support for a completely new image format or a new vector image format, right? And it might be very, it might be a huge polyfill, but if it turns out to be really useful, then people uh, maybe start using it a lot. And then uh, that is serves as a signal to the standardization world that hey maybe this should actually be standardized and, and made native and that I really like that I actually I wrote I wrote a piece uh, it's been a lot of years ago now called JavaScript will save us all which was a little bit of maybe hubris but it was sort of making this argument it's like the hey if browsers lag we can write JavaScript to get them up to date as we've been doing. And we can also speculatively, you know, like try things and see if we can figure things out, uh, new things 
that um, even if the various working groups shrivel up and die, we still have the ability to extend the web. Um, yeah. I, never, I never did anything with it. The accessible web people actually, I'm, I'm not in any way claiming that my article inspired that, but actually did work towards that. So they, yeah. you know, they actually get the, the, the credit. I just, I get the credit for having an idea and publishing a blog post, which is about as low effort as you can get in this space. <laughs> well, but I think it fits in with that whole naming thing, because like mm -hmm. I said, it's like, you know, somebody articulated it, but I don't know that there weren't a, a ton of people having very similar thoughts. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because like right around the same time was the birth of really transpilers. Another way that you can try to evolve the web, you can do experiments in, in transpilers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can help shape, as you said, like CSS, but also JavaScript. And yep. um, later, actually, while he was on the technical architecture group, Tag has uh, findings that are not, um, they're not standards, you know, mm -hmm. um, but they are agreed upon by the members of Tag. And this was a piece that was called uh, Polyfills and the Evolution of the Web. It was published uh, 10 days before my birthday in 2017. Yeah, okay. It talks about how polyfills can be a way for us to help shape the web. And um, one of the things that they did in this that I just want to mention is that they explain that whole difference about um, polyfill. And um, while it is a useful metaphor to some people, it has problems. And it also recognizes that we have this polyfill idea and that there were very similar ideas that were slightly different that were called like pony fills and uh, not a fill and a, like all <laughs> these things. And they suggested that those are difficult to pronounce in some languages. They're, you know, they were probably was very of the time kind of word. So, you know, they're not, it's not the best word, you know. So polyfill, like it or not, was we we're stuck with that. And so they suggested that speculative polyfill is a better name. And mm. I, I agree, actually. It's mm -hmm. um, it's less fun <laughs> than polyfill, but uh, yeah. it is. Uh, I, unfortunately, it was made after there was a book published by O'Reilly that I actually wrote a, a blurb for. I didn't write the book. Building Polyfills, that's what it was called. It was by uh, Brandon Satram. Uh, it was published in 2014. It talks about probably fills. So, whoops. Uh, yeah, well. But this, but this, uh, this idea of like uh, also having one URL that you could use. Um, it also offered um, where you could, um, in theory, you know, in theory, you're caching these on CDN, right? So they're they're on the CDN, right? Like there's only there's a finite number of variants, and they they can on the CDN they can just hash those, quickly identify your browser and like just look up the right hash and send that back to you. You know, um, so this is like a cache at the edge where you can have n possible answers, but get the right one very quickly from something that is hopefully geographically close. But <laughs> right, um, but. There are also um, not no issues with that, right? I mean, there was um, there were other reasons at the time that we wanted to point to a CDN, and it's funny that like the lay of the land changes, right? Because most of those things, most of the other reasons that we used to want to do that, they're not true anymore. Um, because like you, we used to think like, well. If you could point everybody at, say, the jQuery CDN to get jQuery, then it's not as good as native, but you can cache just one copy for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, well, caches don't work like that anymore. <laughs> and there was, like, so much work around that as an idea. Um, but it's not, they don't work like that anymore. Like, websites each all get their own fully independent copy of cache, so there's no sharing. 
But maybe we can talk about that whole hash idea because that is relevant to a thing that developed at around the same time. Go for it. Called sub resource integrity. Yeah. And sub resource integrity uh, had among its original use cases these similar ideas that was like we could maybe just cache once for everybody, you know, like so you right. could only have one copy of jQuery. And so, they were trying to combat this idea that um, there's a danger in that because what if everybody trusts this server and then something happens where somebody compromised this server right. or like doesn't even have to be, well, I mean, I guess that's still compromising it, right? I mean, there's many, many ways that it could be compromised, right? Yeah. One of them is it could transfer ownership and the new owners do something nefarious new yeah different with it it's yeah. nefarious or or otherwise but yeah it could be that's nefarious right. that's right it doesn't so, have to be nefarious it just means changing the contract and you didn't you're not getting back what you think you agreed to right yeah so sub resource integrity t tell me if i'm getting this wrong because i might be but from from what i gather it's the it, it's a way of essentially signing things that you're going to be loading. So to go back to that jQuery CDN uh, example, you know, where we said, okay, let's set up a CDN that's just for jQuery and everybody can point to that, you know, and uh, a more recent version of this would be Google fonts, right? Where we, you know, bunches of lots of people just point at the Google fonts site, the CDN, but sub resource integrity was a way to essentially sign that thing that everyone's pointing to. And then everyone that's pointing to it also has a copy of that signature. And then if it ever changes, then the signature changes and something happens, a warning or a error or something like that. Am I roughly correct? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, almost. So it's a Ooh. hash. So it's just like a crypto algorithm. It's a cryptographic algorithm that you run across it that generates some hash that you would use in to uniquely identify this thing. Um, right. And so um, there's uh, some well-known hash um, algorithms yep. in, in the browser. And you can say, um, I, this, I want this to be my JavaScript, or I believe you can do it with CSS as well. Um, and I, but only if it ultimately matches this hash. Um, so you go get all the content, you run this cryptographic algorithm across it. And if yeah. you wind, if the number that, you know, not the number, the, the hash, the yeah. mismatch of strings and numbers that you wind yeah. up with at the end is the same, then you use it. Otherwise you, just, you know, throw an exception in the console. I mean, it doesn't interrupt your program otherwise it just it doesn't happen it's as if it failed mm. you know right it's yeah the browser acts as if it couldn't load the thing exactly because it refuses to load the thing because its hash doesn't match the hash that the browser expects it does tell you why sure yeah, yeah. but from a sort of a from the user end point of view <laughs> right. in a way it's as if the thing didn't load so you know if if google fonts were using this and the font changed and thus the hash changed like that custom font being loaded from Google wouldn't load. The page would render, but the, the font wouldn't load until the site was updated or whatever process there was of saying, yeah, I trust that thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah, at the time, because we were talking about like the caching thing, there was really compelling use case to say like, well, man, I can make it really fast because I could be like, okay, well, we want jQuery, the jQuery 1.3, right? So that, that seemed like a really great idea to me. And I remember being really excited about this. And I put this on the tags uh, radar for a tag review because I thought, wow, that's like, that would be so great. But then somebody pointed out the problem with that that I hadn't realized, which is that let's say you go to XYZ porn site and you find some obscure thing that only exists okay. on that website, you know? Like their logo, maybe, or, you know, like whatever. Okay. Um, and 
then we mm -hmm. include that on my website. We like we include that on my website. And if you visit my website, by looking at the time it takes to load, I can have a pretty good sense of whether you've been to XYZ porn site. Uh, right? Okay. I'm reminded of, yes, the CSS yes. visit yes, yes, problem. Yes. But it's, so, this, is a, this is a timing attack as opposed yes. to a loading attack, but it's still, it's a, it's a fingerprinter. It's an identifier. It's a way to say you have been to X place or you have... Yeah. Whatever. Anyway, yeah. lots of issues with like that caused us to eventually be like, no, nope, no shared caches at all, which is like a little bit of a shame, to be honest to you. Um, around mm. the same time, sure. we were trying other ways to do that. And I remember that um, Adi Osmani, also from jQuery standards team, had made this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just him, him and some other people had made this thing called basket.js. And what it tried to do is like use local storage for caching and loading and uh, like allowed you to build and manage the cache. And like it turned out that it was actually kind of slower anyway. Um, maybe one of those things where, um, you know, you're trying to squeeze every last drop out of it and you're basing that on the current state of things, but then the state of things changes and now it's not fast enough anymore. Yeah. We also then made a, uh, a version of that called tap.js. There's a few of us that worked on that. Uh, it was like me and um, you have worked a little bit on it and someone named Leo Strauss. Um, a few other people too were kind of involved in this, but it was, sort of the uh, a similar thing but it was like trying to do like um like cross domain through an iframe and i believe if i'm not wrong it supported modules out of the box so like um but those are like common js modules they're like the kind that pre-existed regular modules today um but yeah, I mean, there was all these ideas about like modules and and like caching and like CDNs and polyfills and like all this stuff was crashing together. And like the state of the world has changed a little bit, not a little bit, a lot since then. And um, one of the things that changed, yeah, was the owner of uh, the domain polyfill.io. So turns out that Andrew never actually owned that. I'm not sure who did own that. But somebody mm -hmm. had bought the the domain, and it led to this um, this big issue. And I mean, that is a that is an issue with domains. Domains are the one part of the web that are that are centralized, right? We have centralized domain names. Yeah. Yep. And I think we know this, right? Like we know we've seen that happen before. Well, I mean, it's distributed, but it's yeah, it is. It's it's sort of it's a point of weakness, point of failure, point of something where, y you know, yeah, you, if you accidentally let your domain expire, somebody else can grab it uh, and do stuff, nefarious or otherwise. Yeah. And so in this case, I think we touched on it before, but, you know, just to sort of recap for those who aren't familiar, th there was polyfill.io and then apparently it got moved into a, 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 a different CDN uh, you know, whether, however that happened. And so now you've got, like I said, Cloudflare and Akamai and all these, you know, sort of global CDN networks publishing articles about how polyfill.io is now being used in a supply chain attack is what it's called. Um, apparently the new owner of polyfill.io has angrily denied that they're participating in a supply chain attack, but, you know, everyone from the outside certainly seems to think that 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 something's going on and it sure looks like a supply chain attack so you know things are being served up that are not you know the original polyfills um maybe stuff has been added on to them <clears throat> to, to the polyfill scripts or they've just been outright replaced with different scripts and uh yeah the register has a has an article that says something like if you're using polyfill.io as over a hundred thousand people are, you need to change your links immediately. Um, and that is, 
you know, I, I could I could imagine something similar happening if NPM were ever compromised in in this way or a similar way. Or, or I mean, CDN.js. Yeah. Like, there's so many things that are like this that yeah. people just use. And yeah. you know, yeah. another reason that people use them. Well, let let's go to the let's let's go back to the SRI thing for a minute. So, mm-hmm. like the the thing that clashes here that we get um a, a sort of like budding of two ideas that are sort of like incompatible in a way that create a problem is that um, like if you have a website and you, and you even believe all those answers that were like, well, you look at the UA string because there are different versions and I don't want to maintain this. I want to rely on you to maintain it. That means that like you, you accept whatever they send back to you at any point in yeah. time you know yeah. and you kind of have and to that's like you used to be able to on jquery cdn or any any cdn that served jquery used to be able to say give me the latest jquery i just want the latest one mm, whatever that is like yeah. well that's great until it breaks <laughs> right? right and so the question yeah. is like in production what do you do because you you know we have this tension today too even with like browsers and things like you need to get security patches, you know, you need to get updates. You don't mm-hmm. want to mm-hmm. be reliant on those kind of things to have, like for you to be aware of them. Cause it was difficult to even be aware that they were happening for your whole supply chain. Right. Um, so, you know, you would point at this CDN and say, I trust you to update. That is totally in conflict with SRI because it means you, you can't know, <laughs> you know, you can't know what the mm-hmm. what the thing is, and uh, I think for a lot of people, like just trust somebody else to do it was really appealing, you know. And so that's what they did, and so they they couldn't use e- uh-huh. even SRI even if they wanted to. Uh, and then some other people have right. asked the question, like, well, if you have a hash for that thing, it means that basically. The only thing that you will accept is exactly that code, right? And it's a static yep. file. So why not just put it on your website or your website's CDN rather than rely mm-hmm. on some other thing, you know? Um, yep. So, yeah, I don't know. That's all tricky and smashing together. And um, maybe the really interesting pivot here, too, is that because we're talking about hashes and the world is changing and all these things like uh, uh, along the way, a thing that's happened since then is uh, people have talked about using hashes for a lot of other things. Um, So uh, IPFS Mm -hmm. uses hashes to identify content and that and other distributed web things do similar. Um, and they have this idea that's like more like peer to peer networking sort of where, I mean, I'm not an expert in this area, but like, if you remember things like, you know, Napster and, uh, you know, well, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm aging myself (laughs) by, by naming those kind of (laughs) technologies, but you know, where you could have like a, a swarm of people who all had the same file and you can even be downloading parts of it from different people, you know, um, to sort of optimize so that you're not taking too much of any one of those servers and so on, you know? Um, so that's a, that's a pretty interesting idea because you could just say like, I want jQuery 1.6 and it doesn't matter where it came from. Right. Doesn't matter because I'm not saying I want jQuery 1.6. I'm saying I want this hash, and whoever has this hash, just I'm give it to me. I can get it from it anywhere me. or simultaneously from parts of it from six different places if I wanted to, you know. Um, so that that's an I think right. that's a, a really interesting idea. Yeah, it is. Uh, as long as you're confident that you know there's no hash collision or at least incredibly minimal Excellent. hash collision. Do you want to talk risk. about that? Yeah, a hash collision is where if you basically can you have two different things yield the same hash, right? So um, if uh, <clears throat> if jQuery one point six yields, you know, 
this hash. Can you also have real bad things.js yield exactly that same hash? Because if you if you can, then someone can put up real bad things.js. And then if you have a system that's just looking for hashes, be like, just give me this hash. I just need this hash wherever. Okay, I'll take that one. And it turns out not to be jQuery 1.6. It does bad things. It's crypto miner right. or whatever. Um, it, right. So, yeah, I mean, people who create hashing algorithms, generally speaking, if they're trying to do a good job, will work very hard to, you know, construct a system that is incredibly unlikely to have hash collisions. I don't think, I think mathematically you can't absolutely rule them out. You know, odds of one in many illions. I don't even know how many illions that it would be, you know, septa quadrillions or yeah. something. Um, chance of two unrelated things yielding the same hash. So yeah, there's this, yeah, there's this desire for uh, trust and reliability and there's a desire for flexibility and those two things conflict. Like as far as I can tell, it's an unresolvable thing. You want the flexibility to just be able to say, just give me the latest version of jQuery from wherever. I don't care where it comes from. I just want the latest version of jQuery from the web or the net. And being able to do that is fundamentally in conflict with the desire to want to be absolutely certain that you're getting a version of jQuery 1.6 or the version of jQuery 1.6. Like those two things just don't yeah. go together. And it's, yeah, I mean, that it's, I'm sure it's not the only place we see that tension. Like we always want our jobs to be easier, but it'll, in, in at least some cases, the things that, you know, the, the way to make the job easier also makes it more fragile in some ways. Like, makes the makes our process makes can can make the processes less uh less robust and less less trustworthy yeah. right so we saw that with polyphileo and i i actually said earlier you know what if you know like maybe npm could be supply chain attacked uh and then that twigged in my head wait weren't they and i went and looked and yeah a couple of years ago there was a supply chain attack on like a few dozen npm packages where it started uh you know, with the, the updates, when, when people just ran their NPM update, whatever, they got the latest version of whatever these packages were. There were, there were as I say, a, a couple dozen, few dozen of them, something like that, that had malicious code in them. Yeah. Or certainly had code that was in no way related to what the package was originally intended to do and what it was installed for. And like there had, like there were news articles and, you know, trying to get the word out as much as possible. Like check your packages, check to make sure if you're using one of these packages that you didn't get the malicious code and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because NPM makes, gives you a lot of flexibility and offloads a lot of uh, the burden of maintaining this stuff to somebody else. Like it becomes somebody else's problem. I don't have to deal with this. I just grab the code and thank them very much for providing the code in my head but uh, my company probably doesn't actually donate any money to support the people who maintain those packages. And then, yeah, they get compromised. You know, maybe somebody who's running, uh, who's been writing some, some packages is like, you know what? Nobody ever donates. Nobody ever supports my Patreon. Uh, I've been doing this for free. And now I've got somebody who's willing to pay me $25,000 for my five, packages i'm gonna take it yeah or just uh what what i've seen happen in other cases um uh i mean there have been a lot of cases like this over the years but you know that that's one yeah. where it gets bought out another is um just like it was a, a domain and whoever owned the domain mm -hmm. um retired or died or you know like just lost just interest forgot or that, that 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 like it was on mm -hmm. this credit card that was no longer uh, valid yep. and it just expired and they yep. lost the domain, you know, um, or in terms of like the NPN packages, what happens is, you know, like, um, Joe Schmo, um, has this idea for a library that maybe is useful and he makes this library that is maybe useful. And, um, suddenly people notice it and it is useful. <laughs> it takes a lot of, uh, it, 
it gets a community around it and this community then becomes like big corporations you know like google facebook apple you know everybody is using at some point through the supply chain this person's um labors for free and nobody is sponsoring it and it's not their day job and they he's like lots of pull requests to deal with and it just gets exhausting and you know after doing it for years uh you get somebody in the community who is um helping out a lot you know and they offer to take it off your hands and and continue the the work but you know you don't know them you only know them from their commits and then it turns out that they were just playing the long game to get you know to get access to the thing that's already in everybody's already in everybody's code um so Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's tricky and the there's again this tension because the from a code standpoint the hash thing is i mean that's what we've always done in a way right like if you remember like you would download stuff it would always say like get this you get this md5 checksum and and run it and make sure that the thing that you got is this thing you know i mean that's the whole Mm -hmm. idea here and for code that makes a lot of sense technically to make sure that it doesn't break but um also like you said, practically speaking, who is going through and chasing all of those through the system and, and reviewing them and making sure that evil didn't creep in at like the thing that does left pad on strings, you know? Yeah. Um, yep. Little yeah. left pad. I mean, there's so many, there's so many things like that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's really tricky. I, I don't, I don't really have a, a total answer to it either. Um, Part of it, I would say, is um, coming to grips with not to sound like a broken record or a a constant commercial for the same ideas, but like um, I think coming to grips with the realities of open source. Like I think we're far enough into the open source era that we can see that the current shape of it is imperfect, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Yes. We need open source to be actively funded. Um, We need it to not be so one way. We need to think about how we deal with issues of trust and safety. And, um, you know, I think, I think we have some, some learning to do on this, but, but another interesting corollary here though, is like, um, you know, when you're just asking for content. um, So, you know, if you, want an image if you can ask for it via hash in theory that would eliminate the um you know the domain problem you know where like somebody can somebody right. can steal the domain or not steal it but just your lease is over is somebody else's now you know uh or mm-hmm. you gave it away you know so now somebody else controls it and it's no longer that thing this is a really big deal for um, verifiability too, right? Um, so if you want the web to last a long time, you want to be able to make sure that this link that I am sending to you, that like it will be the thing that I'm looking at right now. <laughs> you know, I want to save yeah. this and make sure that I don't point this for for reasons of like avoiding misinformation and stuff. You know. Um, so there is also in, uh, schema.org, uh, Dan Brickley has similar proposals that like, maybe, maybe this is good for that too. Maybe we should look at hashes as a way to say for content that I'm linking to even, you know, that is this what I think it is? Um, and this Mm. also gets tricky not to. (laughs) Um, I, I've built systems that use it, like hashes incredibly. And when you start using them for like a web page, um, boy, that's super tricky because it means that anything that you like, what are you hashing exactly? Right. So yep. like if I hash just the content of the HTML, you'll verify that I get the HTML, but somebody can have JavaScript or CSS that modifies the page. So it doesn't mean that I've got the page, right? 
Um, or if I say, mm -hmm. I want to make sure that this page is exactly what I say it is. Um, well, right. what happens if they change the copyright date at the bottom? Yep. You know, like it's very, very tricky um, for all these purposes. But I do just think it's like so interesting um, that we want to build things that are somehow maintainable and um, safe and performant. And we have mm -hmm. like efforts in all these areas, but over time, sort of the the facts on the ground change too. And it gets, I don't know, they, they cross pollinate each other, but they also kind of like make the story difficult for, <laughs> for the other ones in a way. Yep. Yeah. As we always say, it's difficult and it depends. Yeah. Like what the best, what's the best, what's the solution here? Well, it depends. It depend. What do you want to, what do you want to optimize for? Basically. Um, so yeah, if you're using polyfill.io, you shouldn't be using polyfill.io anymore. Um, there, yep. Turns, turns out. out. Um, Hopefully there will be more clarity over time as to what actually mm -hmm. happened, but, and who knows, maybe it will all get resolved and, and cleaned up, but, even if it does, I think the question at the other end, at the other end of that is, do you do you go back to using it? I mean, I would argue no, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know that the point of this chat is to suggest solutions <laughs> as much as yeah, just sort of explore, explore and talk about the the history and the the things that were happening and how we got to that problem. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Brian, All thanks. Right. Thanks. Good chat. Good chat, indeed.